Hello and welcome to this discussion on the next step to the Europe's Green Deal Industrial Plan, organised by So the Power Europe and part of EU Sustainable Energy Week. Thank you all for joining us, whether you're online or in the room, you're very welcome to this discussion. My name is Kira Taylor, I'm an energy and environment journalist based in Brussels, and I'll be moderating this event as we look at how to strengthen Europe's clean tech industry and maintain its competitiveness. We'll start the event with a poll on Slido to get everyone warmed up for the discussion. We'll then hear from Jacek Trzynski, Deputy Head of the Green and Circular Economy Unit at DG Grow at the European Commission. After this, he will join us for our panel discussion on Europe's Green Industrial Plan and the various pieces of legislation that are looking at growing Europe's competitiveness in this area. Towards the end of this, we'll have time for your questions. You, you can submit these via the QR code after the poll. Now, industrial policy and competitiveness have been growing in importance recently. Having a strong clean tech industry is essential for Europe, but there are worries that it could lose out to other regions of the world. For instance, there are concerns about the strength of Europe's supply chain and its volatile energy prices. Similarly, there are questions as to whether Europe has enough skilled workers to bring this about and enough incentives to grow a clean tech industry on home soil. Other parts of the world are also doubling down on this rate, including the US, whose Inflation Reduction Act, or IRA, caused ripples across the European industry. The European Union is now trying to address these questions. In February, the European Commission presented its Green Deal Industrial Plan, focusing on four pillars, a predictable and simplified regulatory environment, speeding up access to finance, enhancing skills, and open trade for resilience. Then in March, we saw proposals for the Net Zero Industry Act, Electricity Market Design Reform, and the Critical Raw Materials Act. Under the Net Zero Industry Act, which undoubtedly we'll come back to a lot today, the EU sets out eight strategic technologies deemed technologically ready and useful to help Europe decarbonize. I'm going to list them now, just in case no one has seen the annex, which I'm sure everyone has, but they are solar, photovoltaic, and solar thermal onshore wind and offshore renewables, batteries and storage, heat pumps and geothermal energy, electrolyzers and fuel cells, sustainable biogas and biomethane, carbon capture and storage, and grid technologies. And a lot of our speakers today are from those industries. The draft law sets out a benchmark for domestic manufacturing, aiming for at least 40% of these technologies to be manufactured in Europe. Funding could also be available. We saw the Strategic Technologies for Europe platform this week, and I'm sure we'll get into the details of that soon. But is all of this enough to secure Europe's clean tech future? Well, we'll discuss that in our panel later. But to kick off our debate today, we want to get your opinion on this. So we want to get your opinion on the list of the eight technologies set out in the app. On the screen, you should see a QR code that will take you to our question on the annex. The list has pr proved controversial for some. The European Parliament rapporteur, for instance, wants to scrap it entirely. Meanwhile, industries left out of the list, notably nuclear, are arguing that they should be on it. So our question that you can all see in front of you is, do you consider the Commission's list of eight technology categories to be right for the Green Deal Industrial Plan's objectives? You have about a minute to submit your vote, so let us know what you think on it. And I'm actually too short to see the screen over this, so I'm going to have to do a meerkat peek over it. Okay, so at the moment we have 54% for no to limited and split between the other two. And I'll give you 30 more seconds to input your answer if you haven't managed to already. We still have some votes coming in. Okay, well, I think we'll close it there for the moment. So we have almost 60% saying, no, the scope is too limited. Around 30% saying, yes, it's exactly right. And a few saying it's too wide. We'll get into that discussion later as well with our panelists. 
But first, I'd like to invite Jacek Trzaskowski to the stage, or to his microphone, for the opening words. He is the Deputy Head of the Green and Circular Economy Unit at DG Grow at the European Commission and can, can give more details regarding Europe's green industrial policy. So the floor is yours. Thank you very much and uh, good morning everyone. Uh, I think you provided already a quite comprehensive introduction on what is in those proposals that we have uh, recently tabled and I think probably most of you uh, know about them a lot. So what I would like to do uh, in this couple of minutes is to uh, present shortly what is happening in the markets because I think it's always useful to see uh, the trends and then maybe say a few words about the uh, emerging main topics in uh, uh, the negotiations on the Net Zero Industry Act. As you know, we already started negotiations with the Council. The Parliament is progressing very quickly with their work on that. It's a high priority file, so, uh, so uh, well, the, the scope on which you have uh, uh, just provided your opinions is one of the main topics, of course, and I will say also a few words about that. So, uh, you know, the Green Deal Industrial Plan and the Net Zero Industry Act were really to, there are proposed to uh, scale up the production of net zero technologies to strengthen our supply chains. Uh, until last year, the focus of policymakers in Brussels and member states was really about deployment, but with the IRA and with developments notably in China, we have seen that we really need to focus our attention also on where the uh, equipment that will power our future energy system is, produ uh, is produced. And in that context, we have tabled the Net Zero Industry Act and also a couple of other elements, notably um, linked to financing. And I will say a few words about that. So uh, that was done um, early uh, this year. Uh, and I think it's, as I said, uh, worth to have a look at what's happening on the market. So for, for a couple of those technologies on solar. So, we have the Solar Alliance, and if you look at the project pipeline, so the announced investments, we are on track to reaching our 2030 target of uh, reaching 30 gigawatts uh, of production capacity across the uh, supply chain. Uh, and, you know, this is quite, a, uh, quite an achieve, well, achievement, uh, uh, achievement still to be realized. It's important to underline that. But we start from very low, low points. So we have project promoters that are ready to go ahead and they just need to get the right signals to finalize their investment decisions. When you look at the specific projects, recently, uh, actually not an announcement, but a project that is going ahead, uh, Holosolis in France, five gigawatts of production capacity. This is really massive and this is important because if we want to be competitive uh, uh, compared to China, we need to uh, scale up. We need to have those gigafactories. Another uh, interesting development in solar, an announcement by Longi, which is one of the main world producers of, of solar PV, a Chinese company of an investment in Germany. Uh, that can indicate that China is also starting to understand, Chinese investors, that Europe wants to uh, develop its own production capacity. And of course, we are open to investments all, uh, from, from across the world, not only domestic uh, manufacturers. So that's for solar. Batteries, uh, a, an investment that received a lot of media coverage is Northvolt, Northvolt 2. Uh, again, a gigafactory, important development showing that we can compete with the IRA. But then when you look at the trend, so under the European Battery Alliance over recent years, we have really achieved a lot, 130 billion of secured investments. And the trend until the IRA was announced uh, was really growing every year. But since... Uh, a few, uh, well, since two quarters, basically, the trend has reversed. So we are no longer on an upward curve, but on a stable curve. And this is, of course, not a uh, very good signal, and this is not what we want. Uh, and the, the, the third uh, uh, ec uh, ecosystem that I wanted to mention is wind. So, you know, the, the wind sector in Europe has been, of course, struggling financially because of complex reasons. The good... Uh, the good uh, element here, the, go uh, the good news is that deployment is increasing. So if we talk about offshore wind, last year there were no uh, final investment decisions whatsoever in Europe. This year already five, four gigawatts of capacity. And of course, if you want to make the supply chain competitive, the first element to do is to have enough projects in the EU. So this is very important. 
there have been also several investments announced in the supply chain, notably in foundations and cables. So I would say that uh, the, the picture is mixed, and uh, you, you see this expression often that the race is on. It's on, and, and of course we uh, are far from losing that, and I think we are uh, building our tools to uh, be at the forefront of the race. So now let me just say a few words about the Net Zero Industry Act, where we are, what are the main topics, and also a few elements on uh, financing. Um, the first element, very important, uh, scope. Uh, indeed, uh, there are very diverging views between stakeholders and also co-legislators how we should go about it, whether how wide it should be, how, how, uh, and, and you know, our approach is that we should be technology neutral, but at the same time we need to have focus on a couple of key technologies because simply uh, there's a very clear trade-off between the intensity of support we can give and the uh, width of the, of the scope. The wider the scope, the less intensive uh, support from public sector will be. And we clearly see this uh, in our discussions with member states in the Council where they say all this uh, support to skills, all this accelerated uh, permitting requires more administrative capacity. Uh, we, you know, our public budgets are strained, strained. we don't have the, the means to do that. So we really need to keep that focus. At the same time, uh, we talk about supply chains, right? So it's important to uh, support uh, those industries throughout, if you talk about the vertical scope, to support them up to uh, processed materials. So, you know, if we talk about uh, green steel produced specifically for uh, wind turbines. This is something that we would definitely want to have in the scope. So that's the first element, scope. The second topic that is emerging in the negotiations is uh, how to strike the right balance between supporting those uh, su uh, supply chains and ensuring that we don't uh, uh, lead to a significant incre increase of the cost of their deployment. Uh, because, of course, our energy transition will require very significant investment costs. And I think some of the ind industrial alliances, green technology alliances, have been pointing to that, uh, that uh, this buildup of, of domestic supply chains will uh, result in uh, increased costs. If you look at the proposal that we have tabled in March, we have kind of uh, tried to balance that. So, for example, you have the... Um, provisions on public procurement and green uh, auctions for green power, which will require member, state, member states to factor in the award criteria uh, where the equipment comes from in certain cases. But they would not have to do that if the cost difference stemming from the application of these criteria would lead to a 10% price increase. So we have set the bar at 10%. And there are, there are diverging views, of course, whether that's enough uh, or not enough. But it's important also to send a signal to our companies that in the long term they will really need to be competitive because we cannot just support them and protect them uh, indefinitely. Uh, so that's the, this, the second topic uh, that is emerging. And uh, the third topic, administrative capacity, something that I mentioned already. So indeed, member states... Uh, are in a difficult situation. They do not have a significant resources, additional resources to uh, allocate to those, to supporting those industries. So it, in some cases, uh, it would have to uh, be done through reallocation from other uh, uh, pr policy priorities. Of course, a lot can be achieved simply by sim simplifying procedures. And this is something that we have been underlining for permitting notably. But we also have to support member states where this is necessary. We have appropriate tools at EU level for building administrative capacity um, through, through appropriate programs. And, and this is something we have to uh, make clear to member states in order to sec secure their support for, for ambitious proposals, uh, ambitious uh, provisions of the Act. And the, the final element I wanted to mention is financing. So, of course, when the Net Zero Industry Act was tabled, it received quite a lot of criticism as an inadequate response to the IRA. The IRA is all about money. There's no ring fence budget for those sectors in the uh, Net Zero Industry Act. It's important, and today we discuss indeed the Green Deal Industrial Plan. So, the Net Zero Industry Act is part of a broader uh, set of measures that we are tabling. It creates mechanisms for accessing financing 
that is already out there or new financing that is being uh, put in place. And I think here we really have to uh, uh, rebuke the, uh, the accusation that the EU is not providing the financial means where they are necessary. So just a few words about that. Uh, last year we have tabled the Repower EU amendment of the recovery funds, 20 billion of additional investments for those objectives. We are working with member states to make sure that they factor in their plans also support to supply chains of net zero technologies. I must say we are not always successful. Only a few member states uh, have decided to do that. And I think it's important to continue making the case for that. Uh, second element, invest EU. Uh, you have seen that the Commission this uh, week has uh, tabled STEP, the former sovereignty fund. Uh, there's a lot of very re relevant elements for these uh, sectors there. So notably for InvestEU, 3 billion euros of additional uh, money that would be directed towards uh, strategic projects. Similarly, for STEP, Innovation Fund, 5 billion of additional resources uh, for those objectives. And, and, and then uh, last element, which is uh, often over, uh, people don't notice, is that the Commission has proposed to modify rules for cohesion policy. And here we talk really about massive financial resources. So member states would be able to support net zero uh, manufacturing projects, not only for SMEs, as is the case today, but also for larger corporates. And since we talk about gigafactories, this is very important. And so now it will be very important that member states fully use those uh, opportunities. We have to jointly work with them to simplify uh, our framework. I think this is the main conclusion we draw from the Inflation Reduction uh, Act. And we also have to be careful not to overcompensate companies because the IRA is really a waste of public resources. 60% aid intensity for production capacities. The market should not work like that. So we should support industries where this is absolutely necessary, but not beyond what is necessary. And as I said before, we have to make sure that in the long term, those companies that receive that support can stand on their feet when they compete with, uh, with Chinese companies. So... Um, I would stop here, and uh, I really look forward to the debate with, uh, with all of you. Thank you. Thank you. A really interesting introduction, I think, especially given the, the importance of the finance question there, particularly when we do talk about the Inflation Reduction Act and other competition the EU is facing. Well, with that, I would like to introduce the rest of our panel today to, dis to discuss the next steps for Europe's Green Deal Industrial Plan. We have Dries Ack, Policy Director at So The Power Europe. Carla Wellens from Direc uh, Director of Quality, Health, Safety and Environment at Smolders. To talk about storage, we have Patrick Clarence, Secretary General at the European Association for Storage of Energy. Representing the electrolyzer industry, we have Christopher Frey, Head of Public Affairs at Sunfire. And finally, on heat pumps, we have Thomas Novak, Secretary General of the European Heat Pump Association. And of course, Jacek from the European Commission will remain with us for our discussion. So to start us off, I'd like to invite each of our panellists to give a quick opening statement. Dries, let's start with you. What do you see as the next steps for Europe's green industrial plan? Yes, uh, thank you, Kira. And, and let me maybe open with a question to the audience. Who believes that China's industrial policy was technology neutral? What? <laughs> Who believes that the US IRA is technology neutral? The fact that we talk about technology neutrality in an industrial policy conversation tells me that we are not used to that conversation. It's a new topic for us, for Europeans. It's a new topic for the city. And we are clearly at an initial stage of understanding what we're actually talking about here. And that means that if there's no focus, there is no industrial policy. So if you then look at what needs to be considered as being part of the scope of this Green Deal industrial policy, I would say think about where we are vulnerable. Think about what we are going to base our future economic prosperity on and make sure that we don't have an Achilles heel as big as uh, uh, a swollen Achilles heel. Yeah? Uh, I work for the solar industry. People love solar. It's booming like never before. What's going to happen in the next five years in terms of solar deployment has nothing to do with what happened in the last 20 years. It's another scale. We're going to base our Euro European economy and our prosperity more on solar than anybody would have expected, including ourselves, by the way. Yeah. We cannot leave the situation of the vulnerability that we have now with dependency on China untouched. 
we can do it, because Jacek is right. There is movement in the right direction in Europe in terms of solar manufacturing. But I, I must say that I'm afraid that the, the upbeat message that we're on track is not entirely supported with the feedback I'm getting from the members. Yeah? Um, we see development in the right direction when it comes to the modules and the cells, so which is the end of the supply chain, like the end product. But that's, I call it like superficial resilience. It's not deep resilience. And that means that we have real vulnerabilities deeper in the supply chain. Polysilicon, ingots, wafers, I don't expect you to understand it, but it, that's where we have the vulnerability. So I would argue for focus, because industrial policy is about focus. And I wouldn't say, like, why don't we focus really on where we're most vulnerable? And for solar, I would say, let's do ingots and wafers if we have to choose. Because you're right, we don't have eternal budgets and money, and that's going to be the critical point. So the more we think technology neutral is important in discussion, the less we're going to do, and the more vulnerability we're going to create. Maybe I'll leave it to that then. Thank you. So a call for deep resilience and a focus as we approach this, this legislation. Carla, let's come to you next. What is your approach to this topic? Good morning. Uh, maybe just mentioning that uh, I work for Smulders, but uh, Smulders is also part of uh, the OFA Alliance, and OFA Alliance consists out of uh, five companies working for the offshore wind, being blood, SIF, EEW, Steelwind and Smulders, and we are uh, happy to work on the offshore wind industry. And I think with offshore wind in Europe, we are already um, getting a lot of involvement in the EU targets uh, of emissions, of the CO2 emissions. And I believe what Dries mentions is to have focus, and for us it means that we will need uh, a good balance between speeding up because we still are not on the verge of what they is wanted, being the 36 gigawatt uh, by 2030 annually. We are only at uh, 7 gigawatts if we believe wind Europe. And that's, uh, yeah, that requires some speed up, but also uh, scaling up. And the scaling up, we need to do that in steps uh, just to survive, because it will bring a lot of investments and also um, a scale up of work, skilled workers, which we do not have now, and we for the, a double of production, we will need also a thousand more skilled pers persons in different uh, uh, areas. Thank you, Patrick. Let's come to you next. How do you view this issue, and what do you think are the next steps as Europe looks to boost its competitiveness? Thank you very much, Kiara. I would like to share some numbers on storage. So representing the storage industry, I will look from a storage point of view. We had a session this morning about the energy storage coalition with the renewable sector, wind, photovoltaic, and also storage. In there, I shared the number, and sorry for the ones who were there. We will need to deploy in Europe 200 gigawatt of installed capacity of storage by 2030, seven years from now, 200 gigawatt. Today, we have 60 gigawatt. We built historically one gigawatt a year. Also, if in the last two, one, two years, we built two to three gigawatts, so I see an increase. But we're nowhere near the 14 gigawatt of energy storage we need to install in Europe. 14 gigawatt a year, we come from one gigawatt. So it's huge what we need to do by 2020, by 2030. And by 20. 50, if you want to wait until 2050 to decarbonize, Claude Thomas in the session before said it's too late, then we will need 600 gigawatt of storage, 600. <clears throat> so where do we get these technologies from? It's a choice we have to make, and we can either say we are quite uh, open and we would hope that the market delivers and that uh, maybe other people have the skills and bring us these technologies to Europe, or we can say that we and see strategically we need a certain amount of production in Europe. And production in Europe means then also do it in a way which is compatible with the, I would say, uh, world trade rules. And if you go on the different tools we see coming up, which is, uh, we saw the Critical Raw Material Act, we, we have the discussion on, on this Net Zero Industry Act, we have the batteries regulation which came up, which, for, which requires recycled content. We see the tool which is called the Carbon Border Adjustment Mechanism, which is not for storage yet, but eventually we'll get there, where you have to compensate the CO2 emitted 
which you did not pay for. You have to pay it when you enter the European Union. So we see a lot of tools helping this. But we see that the investment decision, the final investments decision are not, the market conditions are not there to make final investments condition to invest in Europe. We just see it for the moment. So we would like to stimulate this. And the Net Zero Industry Act is for us a document which is very helpful in, in this way. We heard before, and I, I like very much, you said it will be fastly treated because it's a high priority file. So what happens if all high priority files, if all files become high priority files? Do we still have high priority files then? So it's a bit, so if, if everything is high priority, nothing is high priority. So it's really the same logic you need to apply when you talk about the technologies you have chosen. So make sure that you, you push the ones which you see as more strategic in Europe. Thank you. Thank you. So both yourself and Carla are showing the, the scale of the challenge and also I think we'll get into the market um, later and see whether there really are the right incentives there. Christopher, let's come to you next on this. How do you see the next steps of the Green Deal Industrial Plan? Thank you very much. Uh, it's good to be here and provide the view of an electrolyzer manufacturer. Um, electrolysis, for those of you who are maybe not familiar yet, um, is the process to produce green hydrogen from electrolysis and water. Uh, sorry, from electricity and water. Um, and I think Sunfire, my company, the company I work for, is very representative of the hydrogen sector in Europe. We were a startup in 2010 founded by three colleagues who are still in the company. Um, and we're currently a mid-sized industrial company with 600 employees. Um, we are executing projects with industrial customers like RWE, Unipar, Total Energies, and so on. Um, and we are currently scaling our operations at an unprecedented <coughs> speed. Um, other than, I think we're in a bit of a different situation than the solar or the wind industry, not just in terms of the size that the industry has already reached, but also in terms of... Um, what's before us. So we are coming in hydrogen, not from sort of the support side. If you look at wind or PV in Europe, uh, they were supported by feed-in tariffs and that's, that led to the scaling effects in the first 20, 30 years of its operation. For hydrogen, we're coming from the other side. We are defining targets for 2030. We want 10 million tons of green hydrogen in Europe. Um, and that equals 100 gigawatt of installed electrolysis capacity. We're currently in Europe at 0 0.3, 0 0.4 gigawatt. Yeah? So that equals basically a thousand um, fold increase of capacity. It's a huge industrial policy challenge. It's also a huge industrial opportunity for Europe. Um, and I think we can do it because there is a very compelling argument for doing this in Europe. So we have 30% of global manufacturing capacities for electrolyzers in Europe currently. We're losing this share because China is ramping up extremely fast, just like in other technologies. But we still have this edge when it comes to manufacturing capacities. We also have a technological edge. Um, most of the leading electrolyzer companies are based in Europe. Yeah? They're not based in the US. They're not based in China, yet they are based in Europe. Um, and the other reason why we have to do it in Europe is that we have an industrial ecosystem which is very, very compatible with scaling electrolysis. It's not just that these, these industries need green hydrogen. Think of steel, refineries, chemicals, fertilizer production. Um, there is now a broad consensus that we need hydrogen to defossilize these industries, to replace coal and steel making, to replace natural gas and refineries. But the other reason is that we have the industrial skills and the industrial know-how that, that we need for scaling our technologies. Uh, think of mechanical engineering, um, ele electrical engineering. Think of processes like galvanics. We're very good in Europe in, in, in all of these processes, and that's exactly what we need for scaling electrolysis. So I want to applaud the European Commission for having included electrolyzers and fuel cells into the list of strategic net zero technologies. I also think it's a very positive sign that we now have the Net Zero Industry Act, and it's also a very positive sign that it took only eight weeks from the first announcement of uh, President von der Leyen and Davos to the actual proposal. Um, so I think that's, that's, that's a very, very reassuring sign that we're now taking into view these technologies and we're saying that's what we want to scale in Europe until 2030 because we know those are the strategic technologies of the future. Um, 
and we are offering to help in making this instrument, the Net Zero Industry Act, um, more effective. Because I think um, there are some good uh, foundations in there, but um, when it comes to the details and the, the, the concrete instruments, the concrete measures, we can give it much more teeth uh, um, to, to, really, um, to really match, for example, the, uh, the IRA. And I have to, I, I can't help making this comment. Um, we always say markets should work for themselves, but in a way, Europe is a goldfish um, in a shark tank, yeah? because other regions in the world are, are doing this. Yeah? They, are, they are looking, they are really targeting strategic technologies and subsidizing and putting billions and hundreds of billions of, 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 of dollars or, or euros into this, and, and, and we have to do something. It doesn't have to be only subsidies, but it has to be effective, and we have to make sure um, that it really helps these technologies scale um, according to the targets that we have set for ourselves. I think we're all going to carry the picture of the goldfish in the shark tank with us for a while. It's a very interesting way, but also a lot of positivity about how Europe has the edge when it comes to electrolyzer capacity and innovation, but it needs to maintain that. Thomas, finally, let's come to you. What do you think are the next steps for Europe's Green Deal industrial plan? Yeah. So... Are you concerned, all of you, that we have a huge challenge in front of us? Then I have to put you into the picture that we have an even bigger challenge, and that's heating. And maybe it's not a surprise that I'm speaking as the last, because heating has also been always the last topic that has been added to European policy. We had a heat strategy in 2014 that took a while to make that really operational. We have been discussing p different pieces of legislation, but the problem that we have ahead of us, and maybe that was so big that people didn't want to touch it, is 75% of heating is coming from fossil energy, full stop. And that needs to change. Luckily, you could say, oh, that's such a big problem. We should invest huge amounts of resources. We should develop a new technology. We should have some man on the moon program, as Ursula von der Leyen has worded it. But luckily, we have a technology already that is truly European. It has an, an edge in world policy, and that's heat pumps. And luckily also, heat pumps have, below the radar, made it to quite a significant market share. Last year, 3 million heat pumps were sold, heating and hot water units, and we're not even calling, uh, counting the ones that are used for cooling. Um, they provide around 20 gigawatts, so I do think that the, IR, uh, the NZIA is a bit modest on its targets, and um, they replace 4.5 billion cubic meters of gas, and that's why also it starts to hurt. The whole discussion that you have on heat pumps in Germany is a discussion that is against people that are taking away market shares from the fossil energy industry. But that's not enough, because if you, if you count 3 million and we have a, a heating market of, three, of 9 million, then we need to triple about uh, the heat pump deployment in Europe. We don't have to do that until 2030, but it would be good if we could. And in order to do that, we need these giga factories. One of our members, a German company, is opening a new factory in Slo Slovakia, in Seneca. This will be a 2.4 gigawatt thermal capacity factory. It goes online in, um, in November, and there is a number of other factories with the same size. So capacity is coming. The industry is investing, and what the industry now needs is the safety that these investments will be honored by local markets. So what we need from the NZIA is simplified procedures, is even though it's not in the immediate focus, a focus on skills, both in installer, but also in, in engineering educational skills. So we need high level people in Europe that can develop and plan the products that we want to see in the future. And that also includes industrial heat pumps, which are really uh, um, at the very back of the development. And then the last thing is we need a local market that works. Because I think it would be an illusion to think we can do all this without a global value chain. If we would stop our supplies from China tomorrow, our market would be dead. We wouldn't be able to manufacture a single product. And I, we are not asking to replace that completely, but we are asking to have a strong European market, and that is mainly dependent on the price uh, ratio between electricity and gas, because if people can save on their heating costs, they will invest in the product. And if they invest in the products, they ask the installers, and the installers ask the manufacturers, and the manufacturers will ask the financing parties, and they will finance the factories that we want in Europe. So it's more than just focusing on a topic, but we need to focus on the whole value chain, starting at a local market that is strong, to have manufacturers that are strong. Thank you. 
Thank you. It's slight to do this there, but a very important to do this. Jacek, I'd like to come to you to respond to what we've heard. We heard your opening statements earlier, but what's your response to the, the statements we've just heard? No, I think there were a lot of interesting points. Maybe just to pick up on a couple of them. I think the, 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 the point that was mentioned on electrolyzers, that our advantage is that we have a whole ecosystem, you know, producers, but of, uh, also of takers, uh, universities, technical institutes, we have to capitalize on that. And uh, maybe something we need to work more on is this, you know, working with off-takers. And I know that for some of the uh, uh, alliances that we run, like Battery Alliance, that was a key success factor, mm -hmm. that there were some car manufacturers willing to, to buy uh, these uh, equipment uh, that was more environmentally friendly and made in Europe. Similarly now, you know, going beyond uh, Enzia with uh, green steel. I mean, green steel, of course, is much more expensive than normal steel, but we have increasing demand for that from EU car manufacturers as well. So we really need to capitalize on that uh, ecosystem we, ha we are creating uh, and, cre and, and, and to some extent also focus on high added value products. So and translate high environmental added value into high market added value. Um, the, the point from Thomas that we, I think it's a striking point, you know, that if you, we stop Chinese supplies today, uh, our market will be dead. Uh, you know, I think this is a striking point. And if you look at the IRA, I think they have currently uh, some problems because they really want to build everything in the States from zero and they simply do not have the capacity to do that. So we have to also strike the right balance between keeping our economy open, because also we export a lot, and, uh, and strengthening our supply chains. And it's not always obvious to do that. Um, yeah, I would stop here, maybe leave the floor to others. Thank you. Thank you, Patrick. I'd like to come to you on the point you raised that the market conditions aren't there. Do you think things like the Net Zero Industry Act are enough to create those market conditions, or do you think more needs to be put forwards? Thank you. So on the part of the Net Zero Industry Act, it's already very helpful because it has two parts. It is talking about storage, and it should encompass all storage technologies. We need storage in, in milliseconds for the systems, for the grids, but we need it also for days, for weeks, months, but also seasons. That's where the different storage technologies come together. So we cannot only push one technology. It will, will not work. We need them all. Um, Regarding then the, is this enough to, to create the market? No, it's not enough to create the market, but it's lowering the entrance. It's facilitating the production and it's creating a very good signal. But we will need, if you want to have storage uh, supporting the renewable deployment without increasing the curtailment. We saw in Ireland last year, they curtailed 15% of their wind generation, 15 already now. And we want to triple the renewables by 2030 we will not triple the grids. So if we want to avoid this curtailment, we need to really have the market who has enough revenue for storing this green electricity. Because the cost of using backup plants is not only the cost of paying the people, but it's also the importing, the emissions, and the dependency on imported fossil fuels. And all this we can get rid of if we store our own energy. So we need to have a market pool also to this with clear long-term revenue streams for investors, so they see that they can invest in Europe, and that's a crucial part too. And Thomas, you mentioned that heat is often overlooked in these conversations. Do you feel like the Net Zero Industry Act and everything else around it is enough to bring it back into the conversation and create those market conditions? Well, I think it's great that the European Commission, and it's, now it's more than DG Ener, that is recognizing the importance of heat, and that is recognizing also the heat the heat pump sector in this case specifically as a local as a european sector and we do have a value chain that runs across europe really from components from uh, to to fans to heat exchangers to compressors uh, to the final product one thing that we we need to focus on in if we want to focus inside that then compressors are probably one of the the biggest vulnerability internally so everybody of you has a compressor in your house is running your fridge so all of you have a heat pump technology, basically, and all of us depend on that. So we, we rightfully put the focus more on that uh, sector, and it's responsible for half of the energy demand. So in, in the same time, the same time, it is uh, important. But is it enough? I would say yes, in the context of the other pieces of legislation that are developed likewise. The, the NZIA is just the final 
uh, icing on the cake on top of all the energy policy that we have developed in Europe and that is close to being finalized. So I think really at that moment, let's not add anything more, let's just implement that. And that is also true for quite a few other pieces of legislation. We are all a bit breathless on the, the frequency of new legislation that has come forward now, and that would also be my advice for the next commission if I'm um, at all asked to give one. Uh, implementation is key. We need to bring the things that we have prepared now into the market and into operation. I think everyone's a bit breathless when it comes to the amount of legislation and for hydrogen and electrolyzers it's probably even more so because there's such a, a, a lot of legislation coming through. Do you feel, uh, Christopher, that everything that's coming through is enough to create those market conditions? Um, maybe let me start by um, replying to what Jacek said uh, just now about the automobile industry um, um, really being a, an essential part of this new, new ecosystem and I think it's a perfect example. Um, because automotive manufacturers have sort of the exact skill set that we need for scaling um, pre-designed parts. For example, we are, uh, are cooperating in Germany with a leading automobile manufacturer to um, stack the electrolyzer cells, and it's basically a purely serial um, automated manufacturing process. Why should we do that all by ourselves when there is existing um, know-how and existing production capacities that so far companies that have produced for diesel engines um, that obviously um, have sort of a rough future ahead of them, and they're very happy that we come across and say, we need what you have. Um, so I think we need much more of this cooperation uh, with existing uh, established industries to make this scale up happen in the short time that we have um, ahead. Um, so if we look at the NZR, I think the first thing to note is that we have, um, and this is one thing that we would criticize, um, we have a um, one-size-fits-all approach uh, when it comes to the objective that we want to reach in 2030. It's 40% across all technologies, all strategic net zero technologies. So from our point of view and considering where the electrolyzer industry is, where it needs to go, um, also the European footprint of the electrolyzer industry, um, and if you compare that to other renewable uh, technologies, uh, they have very different starting points. Um, as I said, 30% of global manufacturing capacity of electrolyzers in Europe. Um, solar industry, I think, is, is already reliant on, on more than 80%, um, at least for most components, from China. Um, so why would, would you put those technologies into one basket and say we want 40% uh, in, in Europe? I mean, um, I think there would be room for really increasing the ambition and say 60% would be easily uh, um, doable. Um, we are members of uh, an alliance with DG Grow uh, called um, the Electrolyzer Partnership, um, where we sort of, as an electrolyzer industry, committed to ramping up production capacities in Europe um, to 25 gigawatts per year in 2025. Um, so uh, if you say of the maybe 15 to 20 gigawatts that we need to add a year, we only take 40% of that, um, that would stay far below what European electrolyzer manufacturers said they can do. Yeah, so I would, I would really uh, advocate for increasing the ambition on the target. Um, uh, and then when it comes to the concrete measures, I think um, what we find important is not just to talk about subsidies, direct subsidies, yeah, but also to talk about de-risking. Uh, that's at least as important for us because um, we have ahead of us, as I said, uh, a scaling challenge of, 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 of really huge um, dimensions and um, many of these electrolyzer companies like Sunfire are comparably new, uh, new mid-sized companies um, and in order to actually make these investments happen in components, in uh, machines that we need, um, we need to have sort of um, uh, this, this, we need to have a guarantee instrument um, that helps us de-risking the scale up. Uh, it, it doesn't just, con it's not just about direct subsidies paid out to, to producers, but really for institutions like the European Investment Bank coming in and saying, okay, we are going to help you um, uh, just uh, taking a bit away the technology risk, the scaling risk, and I think that would help us um, a lot on this journey. Yeah, Chuck, I'd like to bring you in to respond to that, particularly on the one size fits all and some of the other points raised there. Indeed, I, mean, uh, I think there's a lot of uh, misunderstanding around this target, misunderstanding. Maybe it was not presented in a sufficiently clear way. Um, so basically the 40%, indeed, I think if you look at electrolyzers or wind or heat pumps, is not ambitious enough. So this, target, this common objective is more of a 
uh, you know, you can call it the lowest common denominator in a way. Uh, but, but beyond that global objective, which is a global benchmark for us to track our progress, we have to uh, keep in mind uh, the technology-specific objectives that we have under different alliances, partnerships, including the Electrolyzer Partnership. These are reflected in the proposal uh, in uh, the recital, so it's not, let's say, legally binding. And, uh, and the reason for that is that uh, the conclusion of the Commission was that we should not be too over-prescriptive in terms of defining legally binding objectives per technology. Of course, there might be stakeholders that think that we need it in the context of what Dries was saying, for example, that industrial policy really needs to be targeted. But our conclusion was that we, that, that was the balance we, we found. Yeah. And on the de-risking, uh, I, I think point taken, I, I hope that the um, additional resources directed towards InvestEU will help with that. We are also pushing the EAB to increasingly focus its lending not only on deployment but also on supply chains and I think they are starting to get there. Um, yeah, so, so we are moving, uh, we are progressing I would say, yeah. Dries, I'd like to come to you next on this target, uh, the 40% <coughs> benchmark. Do you feel like that is a good thing or do you feel like a one-size-fits-all approach doesn't work? Yeah, I, I, <clears throat> I think it's quite important to be um, specific. Uh, per technology, the starting points are just so incredibly different. The history, let's not forget that uh, on solar, on other technologies, the history is important as well, like what has happened and what does it take to, to reshore. So in that sense, we, we, yeah, we appreciate the reference to the, the, so the target for solar that was also part of the alliance of, of 30 gigawatts by 2030. So this is expressed in an absolute number, a gigawatt, not a percentage. And that's useful. If you do it in a percentage, by what solar is going to be deployed in 2030. What does it tell you? I mean, we might as well deploy 100 gigawatts in 2030 of solar. It could be 150, it could be 200. Yeah. So 40% 40 40 of what exactly? So it's actually not so helpful to think about a solar manufacturing target in percentage numbers. It's much better to do it in gigawatts. Is 30 gigawatts enough? You can debate about it, but we need to take a first step. And considering where we come from, it's not a bad step to take. Yeah. Um, but again, the gigawatt absolute number is more important. Of course, the, the essence of any ambition is the enabling conditions and uh, the financing behind it. Uh, that's going to be the, uh, the, the key points of whether we achieve any targets. And, and I'd like to come back to some of the things I heard because I think uh, Christopher and some others were really right to focus on the importance of the off-taker. We can support manufacturing as much as we want in whatever technology, if there's no offtake and if there's no willingness to pay the premium of the European, let's say, version, the European solar, then what are we actually doing? Then we're just subsidizing paper tigers or things that will be uh, uncompetitive the moment that the, the, the subsidy runs out. So this is really important. And let me, let me just launch a little idea here. The European Commission, has a hydrogen bank in the making. And that's an incredibly interesting tool because it basically tells you what the willingness to pay is from the off-taker side, and it tells you what the cheapest green hydrogen is. And it matches the two together, and then you have a contract for difference. So it gives the suppliers a certainty of off-take, which makes the whole thing bankable. And it gives the off-takers a support, a subsidy, to actually cover that premium you can do exactly the same thing for solar. So we would love to have a solar bank for manufacturing based on the same logic of the auctioning. And I say solar because I work for solar. I think it's, yes, Thomas? I think it's perfectly justifiable to also look at a dedicated bank or double-sided auctioning system for any other technology that is vulnerable and that we need green industrial policy around. So that's the way you do industrial policy. You look at where we need to take action, and you take action with a dedicated financial instrument. So that's my plea for a solar bank. Next. A, a bank of for course. everything, apparently. I just no. want to bring Carla in so quickly to everything. respond to this. The things where we're most vulnerable first, and that's an essential element in the, in the debate. Yeah. Excellent. Uh, Carla, I'd like to bring you in on this idea of off-taking and also of the target, and then I'll come across to you. Uh, we have some offshore banks already, yes. <laughs> uh, we also can grow our capacity enormously. 
Um, but we, we, we really advocate for a level playing field towards uh, some third countries to make sure that we can do it uh, sustainable as well. Excellent, thank you. Thomas, let's come to you. No bank for us. I mean, a bank to sit on is good, but we don't need a heat pump bank. What we really need is this idea of the off-taker, what we would call them the end user or the client, uh, not the off-taker. So it's a complicated word in my opinion, but I'm not English native speaking. Um, I would want to stress again that we need the market that makes it reasonable for end users to invest. We need this home market where the end user says, I want that product and I want that product from a European manufacturer because I think the quality is better, the maintenance is better. Uh, maybe my insight into the operational efficiency is better. And that is not done by the NZIA, but it needs to be connected to it. It needs to be connected to have uh, easy access to the data. So there's something completely different. We didn't discuss that today, but who owns the data that I'm creating? It needs this price ratio for electricity versus gas. And I would really declare that the most important guiding figure uh, and that needs to be changed. It's a political value because oil and gas and electricity prices are political, so governments can change it. I know it's difficult on the European level, but it needs to go on the agenda of the European Council, the Energy Council, to discuss why are we taxing electricity much higher than oil and gas. And since it is not easy to increase the price for oil and gas, probably the best measure is to reduce the price for electricity. Everybody will love you for that. So that, that's really the, the important part, and I've said many other things, but I will not repeat them. So, so no bank, but make the market work so that end users like it ask for products and ask for manufacturing capacity in Europe. And then it's bankable. So this whole discussion about financing, if the market works, if the business case holds, the banks will finance. Thank you. Christopher, I'd like to bring you in now. Yeah, I just wanted to make the comment that in the ENSIA there, there already is a chapter on access to markets, and one of the main features or components of that is the uh, government procurement and the tendering part. And I think it's, it's really good that it's in there because that can really be very effective. Um, but, but again, I think the way it's designed currently in the NZIA is very cautious, you know, very, um, okay, so we, the, the contribution of, of non-price criteria is actually quite small. Or, or there is, I think, the 15 to 30 percent um, of, of sustainability criteria contribution to the actual uh, sort of um, final final decision in a, in a tender. And I think this could be substantially increased because why not have sort of the public, um, you know, the government be the first off taker until this market, at least for hydrogen, really develops. Yeah? Um, uh, governments need, they build uh, roads, they build bridges, they build rail, railroads, and for that we need green steel, we need green cement, etc. So why not um, really give sort of public offtake or, or, or government procurement sort of a bigger role in all this in the first phase of this market development? I think that's something for hydrogen. I'm not sure how relevant this is for other technologies. Um, and I think we have to talk about non-price criteria when it comes to competitive bidding, auctions, um, the Hydrogen Bank, great, great instrument. Um, so far, there is nothing in there on, uh, on, on, on non-price criteria, but I think uh, DG Klima is willing to look into it. How does it, how does it work? How, like, what's the, going to be the contribution of European technology manufacturers in these projects that are then successful in the auctions? And I think we, we have to, to look at that and then learn from that and maybe really think about what, what, what other criteria could be, ESG, um, um, when it comes to really making sure that European technology being produced at very high levels of uh, sustainability, environmental, and, and also social governance um, can actually compete in, in these uh, public bidding processes. Patrick, I believe you want to comment on this. So basically, if you look at it from a higher point of view, we see that we are globally in a race for financial support, subsidies, whatever you want to call it, it's happening. It's there. We see there's a drawbridge mentality happening where some things are not shared with others or others are not allowed in. No subsidy if you don't make the deal in, other, in the American free trade area. We see Chinese supporting and always supported. Dries, you asked this, if this was in the past supported or not, or did develop on market mechanisms, did not develop on market mechanisms. So we're in a, in a position, in a point now, where we need to ask yourself, what do we want to do as Europe? Do we want to play the same game and say we will, and we have to, and that's where we need the NZIA and all the other tools we have? 
Or do we say, no, we want to have free trade and open-minded, and then we'll see what happens. And if the batteries are done in China and the PVCs are done in China, and then so be it. And if the oil comes from Russia and the gas, then so be it. And we will cope with these moments. That's a choice to make. And that's a choice Europe has to make. But if we make the choice that we play the same game, then we need to go in full speed. Then we cannot go timidly. And then we need to think on all the measures available in the NZA, maybe more, maybe other criteria, maybe more market design for pooling European technology. I don't know. But then we need to go full speed. So that's the choices we have to ask ourselves, and that's what we need to do. But I don't think we should do a half-baked cake. Yeah, Czech, I'd like to bring you in now. We've had comments about non-price criteria, different banks for different technologies, and also the global aspect of this, if you'd like to comment on those. Um, yeah, I mean, the non-price criteria, indeed, this is already included in the proposal. Indeed, if you read the proposal, it's not so easy to understand it. Uh, it's complex. It's not by American. It's not by European. And there were calls to have by European, as the states do it there. But, you know, we concluded that it's not in line with the way we approach the, the global order, let's say, and it's also not in line with uh, our interests because we export much more than the U.S. does. So we came up with something more complex, maybe more difficult to understand, but also more subtle and kind of trying to balance different interests. Um, but there's this possibility of, of using non-price criteria uh, already now. Uh, and uh, this is applied by increasing, an increasing number of member states in auctions for green power. We have to make efforts probably to uh, make other member states more comfortable with that, uh, produce some methodologies uh, that really help uh, give value to high environmental performance. So I, I, one point that was made here that the Net Zero Industry Act is important, but it's not the whole story. It's exactly that. I mean, we, I think we have to be active on many fronts. What Thomas was talking about, about electricity gas price ratio, uh, yeah, something to be discussed with ENER. Uh, clearly not in the context of en ENSIA, but in the context of the Green Deal industrial plan. The idea from Dries on, uh, on the hi hydrogen bank, I think that's an interesting idea. And uh, we are happy to discuss with you together with our DG Clima colleagues how the current approach being developed for hydrogen could be maybe in the future extended to other technologies, but because I think clearly the intention under the Innovation Fund is to move towards supporting uh, also the production of innovative, competitive uh, uh, net zero technologies. Thank you. On the global aspect, Drews, I'd like to bring you in here. Obviously, it's a challenge for Sother, and how does the Net Zero Industry Act deal with the, the global aspect for Sother, and do you think it's enough? With the global aspects. Uh, what so, with the supply chain and the international supply chain. Yeah. Um, so, supply chains are diversifying. Um, it is not completely static. Uh, you actually see uh, that some industrial policies in other places in the world are working and are yielding results. Uh, a lot of us are talking about the US, the IRA, uh, but let's not forget there's also movement in India, for example. India is also doing targeted industrial strategy, solar being. Uh, a top priority amongst them. Uh, and they do actually very similar things as the logic of the hydrogen bank, like it's a production-linked incentive scheme. So the, the, yeah, it's interesting how the same approach is taken in India uh, as well, and it's, and it's working. Um, <clears throat> Turkey is also interesting. So I think Europe has a, has, a, has a real golden chance to be part of that. Uh, there is an initiative called the Global Gateway. Uh, so I believe that is, that is the tool where Europe can develop its own sphere of influence. Because we should not forget um, the shift in geopolitics around energy that is now happening are quite definitive for geopolitics in general in the 21st century. So we should really step up. And the fact that we want resilience in supply chains is a fantastic opportunity to make that the commissions, the European foreign affairs prime agenda when talking to neighborhood policy, Northern Africa, uh, other parts of the world. Uh, so it's like, yeah, for a long time, foreign affairs and uh, international the, um, cooperation were almost looking for their added value in the, let's say, the climate agenda. Well, here it is. Let's make it about diversification of supply chains and new cooperations. Christopher, I'd like to come to you on this because you mentioned that the EU has the edge on this type of technology. What's the balance between knowledge sharing and also protecting that edge? 
Um, that's a very good question. I mean, look, I mean, Europe, Europe has the technology and Europe, Europe has invested a lot um, also. And I think this is also really something that we really have to, to keep in mind when we, we can criticize, you know, European Union politics commission uh, as much as, as we want. But I think um, the EU level has, has um, realized the potential of green hydrogen early on. And uh, a lot of um, support has gone into research and development, has gone into demonstrating the technology on a smaller scale. Um, and of course, um, now we have to 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 really keep this um, this 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 edge that we have. And the most important thing there is not sort of protectionism or not allowing the sharing of IP. But the most important thing is to now really uh, be courageous and make this technology big um, as soon as possible in Europe. That's important. We need, the, as has been said also by the others on this panel, we need the demand and the projects in Europe. Um, and when we have this market ramp up, the whole market in Europe, then uh, the projects, um, I'm pretty confident there will be like powerful partnerships between the off takers and the producers and the technology providers. And then we can think about sort of selling the technology also on a global level. Um, as Sunfire, we're currently not looking to China, for example, uh, as a market for our products. Um, so I think the, 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 uh, the risk of, of losing IP um, to China or other countries for us is at this point um, rather limited. But um, the much bigger threat is China subsidizing the rollout of huge factories of electrolyzers in, in, in just a couple of months and then really having um, these, uh, this, these scale effects that we're still looking to achieve in, in, in a very, very short time frame. Thank you. And a reminder to our audience, in a few minutes, I will open up the Q&A. So if we could maybe put the QR code on the screen for those questions, and then you can come up with those in a few minutes' time. But just before that, I'd like to bring in the idea of the scope and the annex. We saw the poll that was done earlier with 45% or around that of people saying that it is too limited. Um, maybe let's come to Drews first on this. Do you feel like the scope, you, you mentioned that we need to be focused. Do you feel like the scope is too limited? Yeah, I, I think it's way too wide, as a matter of fact. Yeah? Um, or, or to put it different, let, let's make this an objective conversation. Yeah? So where is the analysis? Uh, uh, the, the, there's, there's still an impact assessment upcoming. It's published. It's published. Okay. I was, but it, yeah. there was no press announcement. Yeah. So we we'll look at it this afternoon. Um, we need to know. We need a vulnerability test somehow. Yeah. So um, this is this is the this is where technology neutrality comes in. If we can just look at an objective vulnerability test, but then act upon what comes out of that test. Yeah. That is that is the way uh, to look at it. And of course, there is indeed we need a full supply chain approach. So even if you limit it to only a couple of technologies you still have a certain supply chain to look at. So it, is, it becomes wide in the tail of the end product, um, which is another reason to really be strict as to what you're looking for. The Net Zero Industry Act has a number of 65%, which is the threshold when the resilience non-price criteria kicks in. It's a great threshold. So if you have technologies with more than 65% dependency, you're in the category that requires attention and access to funding. And then you're in the category that gets a bank. So heat pumps are indeed not there for the moment. Yeah. Thomas, let's come to you next. Do you believe that the scope is wide enough or not enough? We are happy that heating is covered. That's very important because indeed it's, uh, it is a technology that may not need it on first sight. And that's also something that we have heard a couple of years back when we have approached uh, some people in the Commission for similar coverage as it's given to batteries or hydrogen because we said we can deliver immediately in heating and we don't have to wait. And then the answer was, but you're a European and you're an established technology, you don't need support. But it's exactly that where we stand today to say we are a European technology, we have leadership in R&D, we have leadership in production. Most of the components are in Europe, they are manufactured in Europe by European people, they give perspective uh, and tax income to uh, governments and to society, and that should be kept. So we need to be, we need to be alert that we are not moving below that threshold. 
And by the way, these percentages, I find it really difficult to decide when a product is of European origin. Is it only the boilerplate? Even though I find that word now funny, because if I put a boilerplate on a heat pump, that doesn't really reflect it. But of course, it's from the industrial age. Um, how much of that components need to be from Europe? And a heat pump has seven components. So is it the refrigerant, the heat exchanger, the fan, uh, the controller, the, the steel case? Do we need to make heat pumps with green steel cases? Yeah, that's not part of the discussion today, but if we go into that direction, it will have to be. And then we need to be more precise on how to identify when a product is called of European origin. And again, I really think it's important to keep the global value chain intact and to negotiate much more with the partners internationally that we are not closing our gates and that we are not trying to go all in because Patrick here, I really disagree. If everybody tries to do an all in approach, we'll end up in castles where only everybody can do what they, what they can manage. And actually I'm an economist, so I, I like this, uh, this very, very old fashioned way of looking at uh, comparative advantages, but with full cost inclusion. Just to react, I didn't say we need to do it. I said if we decide to do it, then we should do it fully. Yes, and I would say we should not do that. That would be my. Ah, yeah, that's, that's, I, I don't say we should or shouldn't do it. I feel inclined okay. to step in as well. Okay. I, I would like just to add one point to this made in Europe. We didn't talk about it, but we talk about the just transition and how we take the people with us and creating jobs in these new sectors is crucial in there, crucial in this reskilling. And we really need, therefore, to look at tools we have to, to do this. And how do you see the, the annex and the scope of the annex, Patrick? The scope for the annex, can you be more specific what you mean? For do you feel like it should be wider? Do you feel like oh, there's enough no. clarity on components? No, I, I think for the moment, uh, NZIA is nice. I love it. It's really nice as it is. Thank you very much. There you go. <laughs> Positive for the Commission. Uh, Clara, let's come to you on this. Uh, do you feel like the scope is good when it comes to components and the, what's inside it? Uh, yes, we believe that the annex is wide enough and we shouldn't dilute it f uh, any further uh, and just step into it and, and get started with it. And uh, maybe going to what Thomas said about um, having transparency across the, the global world, that also accounts for the offshore because we... We have a very simple um, product, actually, so it's not our goal to, to be protective on that one. Uh, but we, uh, with uh, looking at the NZIA, we, we really go for the non um, for the for the the things which are uh, some things which are non-negotiable uh, about uh, the non. I'm sorry, I forgot <laughs> how to say it. Uh, there are the non-price criteria. Thank you very much, Thomas. Um, because they will offer us the ability in, in uh, Europe to, to have uh, a step forward. Mm -hmm. We have the techni technical institutions which can help us to provide more information and to make sure that we have uh, a, a very good product, which is also sustainable. Thank you, Christopher. I'd finally like to bring you in on this question of the annex. Is, it, uh, is there enough in it, and what is your view on the components? Yeah, I wanted to make one comment first to what Thomas said. I think, uh, because I, I'm not an economist, but um, I, I, I think I know what comparative advantage is, and I, I'm afraid to say that in a world where at least three different major regions, China, the US, and Europe, are claiming leadership in the exact same technologies, comparative advantage is over. Yeah? So if Ricardo was alive, he would have to redraft his book. So, the, I mean, the US, China, we're all competing in the same technologies and we all want to do the same things. Yeah? Um, and the question is who, I mean, who will be there first? We're talking about seven years, 2030. That's when we all want to have these technologies mass manufactured, um, as I said, thousandfold uh, uh, growth. Um, so I think I, I, I'm more on the all in side actually here. Anyway, when it comes to the annex, um, I think it's to be to be very frank. It's 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 very it's very well. It's, it it really serves the purpose. Um, I would say it really manages to define the major strategic technologies where it makes sense from a job creation perspective, from an industrial transformation perspective, to claim leadership um, or at least make sure that we're able 
to produce these technologies in sufficient quantities in Europe. Um, I think what's more important is to further define the scope of the technologies and of what we need in terms of supply chain of the uh, net zero strategic technologies that are listed in the annex. But when it comes to the, uh, the, the, the length of the list, I say let's, let's keep it at that. Yeah, let's come to you on this because I know there have been questions raised in the European Parliament about how components are included in the list. And also, I mean, some people in the room clearly don't agree with our panel that, that it is uh, enough. What's your view on that? Yeah, very relevant points here. Uh, uh, on the components, I would say the, the whole logic of the Net Zero Industry Act is to have resilience. And you won't have resilience, as Dries said, if you produce uh, uh, the modules, but you don't have any production of ingots and wafers. So the whole logic of uh, the Net Zero Industry Act is to have the scale up across the supply chain. And that's reflected in how uh, the legal provisions are designed. So Net Zero Technologies are defined as end products and components, and including processed materials primarily used for those technologies. So in the context of what Thomas was speaking about, uh, the when do these uh, procurement and auction provisions kick in, uh, what the 65% dependency applies to. Our uh, intention and our reading of, of that proposal is that they apply also to the components. So if a pub uh, pu public authority tenders out uh, 5 gigawatts of offshore wind and wind turbines are supplied as part of that, uh, the public authority would have to take into account where components like the nacelle, the gearbox, uh, were produced. For the gearbox, we already enter into a uh, question whether they are primarily used, because the gearboxes are used in different technologies. So there's further work for us to be done there to define those things, and that's clearly something we need to, to do in the next steps. And I'd like to stay with you for the first question from our audience. So the European Parliament and certain industries would like to see ENSIA with a focus on regional clusters through net zero industry valleys. How do you see this and, and how is that reflected in the Commission proposal? Um, so it's reflected to some... Oh, thanks. Uh, it's reflected to some extent, in uh, for example, in terms of the permitting provision. So uh, there are elements that say when authorities uh, undertake like uh, spatial plan planning, they have to factor in the potential for supporting uh, net zero manufacturing. So here we go towards the logic of creating clusters, valleys, and so on. Uh, I know that the, the parliament is considering reinforcing those provisions, and maybe that's something that is uh, valuable indeed. Yeah. Does anyone else from the panel want to comment on that question? It's actually quite typical to have industrial clusters. We, we have very interesting examples for fan manufacturers, for example, in southern Germany. They are, they have, they, there is an ecosystem that, that has mutually reinforced and even um, virtualized itself because people have left a company, have founded another one, and they are in, in a distance of 30 kilometers. So I'm not sure that this needs to be stressed specifically because also what is important is this the whole thing needs to be simple in the end, as simple as it can get because it is complicated already and the, the bigger you blow the, um, the blow it out of proportion, I would say, then the more difficult to implement. And so maybe one more sentence, I didn't say that so clearly. We are, we are happy with the focus today, and I, don't, I would really warn against extending it, because in the end, if we bring in everything, what, what uh, the, the rapporteur wants, like every technology that can contribute, what does that mean, every technology that can contribute? So simplicity has a virtue here. Yeah, maybe just to shortly add. <clears throat> so indeed, there's an industrial logic to clusters, and therefore valleys, if you want to call it like that. Uh, so that's fine. Now, of course, the way it's introduced in the Parliament is replacing the net zero strategic technologies. And that's, of course, where the problem is. Yeah? I mean, it's, it's perfectly mutually reinforcing to combine strategic technologies with valleys, but not as alternatives to each other. Then we choose for strategic technologies if we have to. And then we have a question more on the finance aspect of this. So what EU policy incentivizes private investment into the energy transition and why should investors provide capital or acquire equity? So we've discussed a bit about finance today. Would anyone in the panel like to take this, particularly regarding private investment? If not, I have to pick on you. Thomas, let's go for it. Do you want to, to hear the broken record? If you create end consumer demand, you will create demand for factories. So it's as simple as that. But now to be precise on the question, what, um, 
what is happening on the European and in EU policy. Of course, it's state aid rules that uh, that can be loosened. It's for sure also making renewable technologies matters of public interest. Uh, we have this big tool of uh, European projects of common interest. I have mentioned that we have a shortage in in uh, compressors from European origins. So making a compressor factory or a compressor initiative, a project of European common interest would be the first thing that would come to mind for me. And then the energy prices, because that is really the most decisive for our technology. And then if you connect it, if we try, there was also this, do you not say where we are integrating them? I think it's, it is also a very clear and obvious development. If you sell photovoltaic first, people start to think, what am I doing with all this electricity now? So should I have a battery? Should I have a heat pump? Should I have an electric vehicle? So this, this, this square of technologies, that could be developed at the same time and that they should be also considered as very mutually beneficial in electric buildings, in electrified industrial processes for a fully fully electrified European energy system. That is something that is, uh, that is important and that could be, then it's about the scope of these support mechanisms. Yeah, Chet, let's bring this to you. What is the balance do you, uh, that you see between EU level financing, member state financing and this private investment? Well, I, I would say that the whole logic, of course, must be to crowd in private investments, and that's how EU support mechanisms are built. So if you take InvestEU, which is this flagship program, it acts through guarantees for uh, inst you know, public finance institutions. And so with every euro of this guarantee, you crowd in on average 14 euros of, uh, of investments. And that's a big leverage, and that's what you want to achieve in general. But the problem now with the IRA is that they spoiled the market, and so now the IRA multiplier is not 14, it's, it's, it's uh, one, well, two. With uh, one uh, euro, you, you crowd in uh, one or, or two uh, uh, investments uh, from, from elsewhere. So the question now in this new context is how to strike the balance between overcompensating, but at the same time achieving our objectives. And here, uh, well, Thomas was referring to the uh, modification of the state aid framework, and did, Indeed, the Commission recognized that we are in a new reality, and for the first time it allowed up to 60% of uh, uh, public aid for productive investments in certain regions. So it's a signal that we want to uh, bring those industries in the EU, and so where this is necessary, we uh, will uh, provide the, the aid. Now, uh, the, the question about EU member states, I think uh, we are increasing resources at EU level, uh, we are trying to do that, but uh, you know we are constrained by the MFF, so there is not so much flexibility you have. At the same time, member states uh, also do not have so much flexibility because they have their budgetary constraints. So we have to juggle all this within what is possible. And I think one comment that Dries also made that maybe for ingots or, or wafers where you need a higher aid intensity to have an effect. You, we have to take into account that, right? So always adjust the, the type and the level of aid to what is necessary to achieve the objectives that we have set uh, under the Net Zero Industry Act and the, the, the general plan. Dries, let's come to you next on this. Yeah, no, thank you. And indeed, so, so my place to go almost like surgical, which is the opposite, opposite of technology neutral, I guess. Um, but to the point on finance, I mean, so yeah, this is important to, to indeed refer to what happened on the state aids. Uh, in March, uh, the TCTF, uh, uh, Temporary Crisis and Transition Framework, um, which is a step towards allowing uh, support for manufacturing, but is again an indication of it's like a baby step. It's a bit like a, um, uh, like, like a first approach out of the comfort zone, but then not really being all in. Yeah? Um, and especially that refers to the points uh, which, which is called 86, uh, that Article 86 under the State Aids Framework, uh, which is about matching aid, so it literally says, you can get in Europe what you get in the US. But, and then there's a whole list of conditions and of limitations to that. For example, you can get the same as in the US, but only for capital expenditure, not for operational expenditure. And that basically undermines the entire idea of having matching aid, because a lot of the <coughs> Uh, the issue is indeed related to the electricity intensity of ingots and wafers. So CapEx is important, but it will not do the trick if there's no solution for OPEX. And let, allow me to link that uh, to the solar bank idea again, because that's exactly what it does. It's CapEx, OPEX, 
neutral. It's just production linked uh, uh, subsidy for the off takers, for the premium. So it, it ticks so many bo boxes from, from our analysis point of view. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Patrick. Let's come to you next. Yeah, very short. So unfortunately, the, the, the broken record worked in the beginning for soda industry, but then it was not working anymore because it was produced in, in Asia, China mainly. So creating the demand helped to start, but then it was siphoned off. So we need to keep this in mind when, when we do this. We also need then to, to talk about what Dries just said, and I'm, I'm back to do we want to match the others or not. Ten years investment security for a company is awesome like the IRA. If you don't match this in Europe to say, listen guys, you also will have 10 years, not only three years or four years, then you would uh, gain from this. The same is this, uh, I support you very much on this matching any aid. If only, it works only if it's unconditional. It's not possible to say, you may match everything, but finally, uh, no, you may not. The, it's blowing up, making it complex. What was just said before from Thomas is not working. It's too complicated. And, and where's the limit then exactly? So I, I would say if you want to go through this way, you should go all in and not have a half baked cake. Thank you, Jacek. Maybe you would like to respond to that. And we also have a question for you on when do you see uh, the Critical Raw Materials Act to be adopted? Maybe you need a crystal ball for that one. Uh, and which of the EU financing programs focus the most on critical raw materials? Well, I, I'm not an expert uh, on critical raw materials, but my, uh, it's the same department of the Commission uh, as mine, so I can at least say that uh, they are going faster than the Net Zero Industry Act. It's, it's an absolute priority for the Swedish presidency. And so, uh, you know, I think we will have an agreement by April on the Net Zero Industry Act, but uh, the Critical Raw Materials Act will be agreed earlier, I, I would imagine. Uh, for the financing, uh, I think it's in increasingly being factored in several uh, programs. Uh, it can be financed through uh, InvestEU. Uh, the EIB in general is moving in that direction, but of course there all these elements around um, environmental impacts as we talk about mining is a tricky issue, so, so there are certain limitations there. Excellent, thank you. Well, I think that's about all the time we have for questions. Thank you everyone who submitted them and thank you to our panel for answering them. Before we go, I'd like to invite each of our speakers to give a quick closing statement. Thomas, let's start with you. What's your key point from today's discussion? Let's make it three. I think the, uh, the focus is right, so don't enlarge that further. Um, keep the market impact of the Net Zero Industry Act in mind and connect it to other pieces of legislation and uh, last implement. Thank you. Uh, let's go around the table. Christopher, next to you. Yeah, I think I can, I can echo the points um, again. In, in Enzia, um, let's, let's really try to take each technology um, with its specifics into account um, and the starting point where it comes from and then define the objective uh, accordingly where we want to be in 2030 um, and try really to make the more concrete um, measures in NZS as, as, uh, as effective as possible. And I think this means really increasing the ambition on things like government procurement um, a, a little bit further. And then I think we need a sort of certainty also on the on the demand side instruments when it comes to hydrogen at least as soon as possible there are a lot of things in the pipeline um, that have already taken a lot of time this also for example co concerns the um, IPCI uh, support we've just talked about funding but the procedures already took more than two years so let's get what we have in the pipeline really across the finish line as soon as possible Patrick let's come to you next getting more and more difficult to find something new <laughs> so actually I don't have a lot of Stuff. I really support what you said about the, the list is the right one. You need to strike a list. And as I said before, otherwise you will have no uh, high priority files anymore in Parliament and we'll have nothing anymore. It's not working. So you need to have a list and the list is working. Then inside this list, you should allow for innovation. So that's important to keep the technology neutrality inside these sectors. If you talk about storage, don't talk only about batteries because it's not helping. You need to have more. You need to have more to decarbonize Europe. And batteries are not the only one we were lacking behind. There are other technologies we are lacking behind in storage, if you look at it. Then um, long-term long visibility. 
if you can increase this time to subsidize for 10 years or 15 years and have it clear for the investors that this is a clear commitment for the next 10 years, awesome. They will, they will do it. Thank you, Clara. Let's come to you next. I can agree on Patrick with the long time agreements because that will give, give us the possibility to scale up and to make sure that our investments are valued. And then uh, maybe some more standard, standardization in public and private procurement will, will help us with that as well. Dries? Yep. <laughs> Yeah, maybe just to refer back to the uh, the image of uh, the goldfish between sharks. Yeah. I don't think Europe is a goldfish between sharks. It's just a sleepy shark between sharks. So I think it is time to straight up back, I should do it myself, as well, and, uh, and be self-confident about what we can do. We have an industrial basis that can be scaled up. Yeah. So being all in does not mean closing our borders. Let, maybe this is a disclaimer we should have started with. Yeah. We need to be all in on resilience. And if we don't do that well, the pendulum might swing too far. So it's, it's a golden opportunity to get resilience right. Yeah? So all in on resilience. And Jacek, you open the panel. It's only right you close it. What's well, your takeaway? Well, it's hard to match that. But, uh, uh, no, but I think uh, indeed uh, we, we have to focus on resilience. And I think we have to acknowledge also all the way we, we went in the next, uh, last six months. Because six months ago, we were not talking about these things. And in the space of six months, we have really proposed a lot of relevant elements. And we now have to focus on, indeed, ha having them adopted, keeping them simple, operational, and ambitious. And so uh, that should be our focus for the next uh, couple of months. And financing, I think this is, the, the money is there, I, I believe. To, some, uh, to, to, to a large extent, and we have to just make it accessible, visible, uh, and simple to use. Excellent. Well, thank you all. Thank you to our audience for joining us and our panellists for the interesting discussion. I believe it's your lunch break now, so I'm sure you're all desperate to get out of the room and go and eat. So I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. <laughs>